uh, again, this is the one I can vouch for. The four cheese natural rising. I haven't tried like any of the other crusts. Oh, hi, this is Mike. I'm ready to start. All right. All right, I have two main things I want to cover this week. And <clears throat> one of them is to continue talking about a little bit about memory and memory management. And the other one relates to... Um, constructors on classes. We have not talked about constructors. I think we had a student ask about constructors in this class, or maybe it was the Android class. And constructors, um, we'll, we'll go over those. So I'm not sure if we'll do like one today, one Wednesday, or if we'll do both today, and then maybe do some more stuff on Wednesday. We'll figure out how it goes. First of all, memory management. Um, to review, we talked about there being two places in memory, the stack and the heap. All right. The stack is where all your local variables, that is variables inside a method, would be stored. All right. And they can be one of two types. They can be primitives or they can be object references. Object re references point to where the object itself lives. And that is what's called the heap. So the objects themselves live on the heap. And object references or object pointers point to those lo locations on the heap. All right. So if I was going to draw the diagram, if we talk about a primitive, a primitive only stores a value. That's it. That's all that is associated with a primitive. So if I say, let me try to draw this like this. In x, then I say x equals 0. What that does, <coughs> excuse me, that creates in the stack, a memory location has a name of x, and it stores in it a value of 0. If I then have a statement later on that calculates a value for x, maybe I say x equals 10 times 10, then the value x gets replaced with the new value. All right. Remember, in Java and in most programming languages, these aren't meant to be algebraic expressions. So a statement like x equals x plus 1 is valid. You know, that's, not al that, that's an absurd statement in an algebraic sense. <clears throat> but in terms of an assignment statement, what that means is take x, add 1 to it, and put the result back in the memory location called x. So that's all these variables are. They're memory locations that contain data. All right? And we give it a name so we can use that name later. All right? So that's how a primitive works. Pretty basic, or dare I say primitive. All right? OK. Now, things are different with an object and an object reference. So if I say pizza p equals new pizza, which remember that's the equivalent of saying pizza p and p equals new pizza. So these two are the same thing. It's like in English how you have like compound sentences where you put and or or in between them. You know, you could write it as one sentence or you could write it as two sentences. What this does, first of all, 
just like this. This created a storage location named X. And I said that we're only going to put integers in that storage location. So then later on down the line, I go put an integer in there, and I'm good to go. All right. Anytime later on that I use this, I'm going to get whatever the last value of it was. Now in the case of pizza p, that part of the statement creates a memory location called p that's going to contain a pizza pointer. That is, it's going to contain an address of a memory location in the heap where a pizza lives. <clears throat> All right? That's what this part of the statement does. This part of the statement actually goes and creates a new pizza on the heap and makes sure P points to it. So, if this was a heap, it would create a pizza object that has all the attributes and methods of a pizza that we defined last time. It would put it in some location in memory. I'll just make a number up. And it stores in the object reference variable the memory location that points to where it's stored. Okay? Yes? Again, um, that's something we will probably talk about when we get into having multiple classes. But in a nutshell, yes. When nothing points to an object on the heap, it disappears. Okay? So that's how it knows that it can get rid of it. When there's nothing that points to it, it can get rid of it. You can also explicitly nullify a pointer by setting it to null and then that will that will kill it if nothing else is pointing to it. Now this has some implications so keep this diagram in the back of your head. Alright and in fact I'm gonna make I'm gonna do a little mini one for primitives. Primitives only involve the stack so I say int x Int y. X equals 10. Y equals x. Y equals x plus 5. <coughs> when I'm done here, what is the value of x and what is the value of y? Y is 15 and what's x? Okay, let's follow that through. In X says, I'm going to create a memory location named X that I can only stuff integers in. That's the type of memory location it is. In Y says, I'm going to create a memory location called Y that can only contain integers. All right? I say X equals 10. What does that do? That assigns to the memory location of X the value, the integer, 10. I then say y equals x. Alright? y equals x. What does that do? That copies a memory location from x and puts it into y. The value of the memory location of x and puts it into y. So well, we're not we're passing anything because this isn't a function call. We are giving it, we are assigning the, memory va the value of the memory location x to the memory location y. All right? Here it comes along and it says y equals x plus 5. What am I doing here? I'm taking the value of this x, I'm adding 5 to it, getting 15, and that I'm storing in y. So, 
It's related to passing by value and passing by reference, but we're not passing anything here. We're just executing instructions. So that's not really um, uh, the, the correct terminology here. All right. The idea is, is both of these are, are locations that store integers. If I set the value of one equal to the value of another, I am copying that, the value of that memory location from one location into another. All right. Now, the same thing happens with objects, believe it or not, except the difference lies in what is contained in the memory location. Because what is, in con what is contained in P and P1 that we're going to create in a minute here for a pizza isn't the value of a pizza. It's a pointer to a pizza. All right? So if I do this. Pizza P. Pizza P1. P equals new pizza. P1 equals P. All right. Let's go through the same scenario with this. All right. Stack and heap. This time we do have the stack and the heap. Pizza P. Memory location called P. It's going to contain a pizza pointer. P1. Memory location called P1. It is going to contain a also a pizza pointer. All right. P equals new pizza. What that will do is that will create on the heap a pizza object. And that will have all the attributes, which I think was size, pepperoni, and all the methods associated with it. It's going to create it in some memory location. We'll say 700. All right? So I say 700. That points to, the meaning of that is 700 is a memory location, the address in the heap where that pizza object lives. I do P1 equals P, or P1 equals P. What does that do? Funny thing is it does the same thing when I say X equals Y except the implication is way different. It's going to copy the value of P, which is 700, to P1. So P1 is going to point to the same pizza. All right. Now, what does that mean? That means, unlike with primitives, I assign the value of y to x, but if I change y, I'm not touching x because I'm changing the value of the data. If I go and do something like this, p set pepperoni false, p1 set pepperoni true, What's the impact of that? If I say P1 set pepperoni false, P, or P set pepperoni false, P1 set pepperoni true. What is the impact of that? When we're done, when the day is done, this object has true set for pepperoni because in both cases I'm pointing to the same pizza. So if I said system dot print ln P dot get pepperoni, it would it would it would say true, all right, because we're pointing to the same pizza. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Good question. If I 
pizza, P equals new pizza. Pizza P1 equals new pizza. Then I say P1 equals P. That's your question, right? Okay, let's follow this through, keeping in mind all the things we said. I put those all on one line just to be concise. Pizza P, that's going to create a pointer, a variable on the stack that's going to point to a pizza. And oh yeah, by the way, I'm also assigning that pointer to a new pizza object that I'm creating here. So let's say this gets created in memory location 8000. So P has a value of 8000, which is a pointer to this pizza object. All right? So, with me so far. Pizza P1 equals new pizza. P1. It's going to create a new pizza object. Let's say it puts it in 9,000. This is a pizza object with all the properties and methods of a pizza object, as this is. Store the pointer in there. Okay. Now, what happens with the next statement? It's going to copy the value of 8,000 into P1. So P1 becomes 8,000. So P1 no longer points to that pizza object. P1 points to this pizza object. Well, what is this pizza object? Pardon me? It gets garbage collected. All right? No one is pointing to that pizza object anymore. Which means, effectively, it's gone. No one can reference it. All right? It's, inac it's inaccessible to anything in the program. So if there was anything in there we needed, too bad. It's gone. All right? So it will live on the heap for some short period of time, short being defined in like computer's terms of what short is, not like people's terms, like oh, a couple days, you know, whatever. Then it will get garbage collected. And what is garbage collection? Garbage collection is Java reclaiming memory. Because if you could imagine you had an application that was running, creating all these objects, at some point it would be made, taking up more and more and more memory. That actually is called a memory leak, when you have code that is written that um, um, isn't, uh, you know, if you're not removing pointers or whatever, uh, where objects are created and never destroyed. Well, Java will take care of it, and Java recognizes, and periodically it goes through and looks and says, ah, nothing points to this object, I can get rid of it. Even in that instant, between the time that we assign this, and the time that it gets garbage collection is taking up memory, but it's of no use to us because we have nothing that points to it to even know that there's a pizza object in there. All right? So that's the answer to that question. And that gets back to your question of when does it go away? It goes away when no one points to it. Yes? If, if I wanted P1 to point to a different pizza than P2, is, if that's what you're saying? In other words, if I did this, P1 set pepperoni, it changes the only pizza object that we have out there. So at this point in time, P1 set pepperoni or P set pepperoni are doing the same thing. They're setting the pepperoni attribute of this object that lives at place 8,000. Okay. Well, if I, wanted, if I wanted P1 to hold a different pizza, this guy is gone. Forget about it. We would have to make another new one by saying P1 equals new pizza. Now, 
Here's an important quick little guide. How many objects get created on the heap? One for each new that you see. All right. How do, when do objects get, so an object gets created when you see a new. So pizza P equals new pizza. It's creating a new object and it's setting a pointer to it. P1, pizza P1 equals new pizza is also creating a different pizza object and it's setting the pointer to that. All right. In fact, this If I said pizza, P1 equals new pizza, pizza, P2 equals new pizza, pizza, oh, whoops, P2 equals new pizza. How many pizza objects are we left with? All right. Okay. It depends how I ask the question. If I were to ask how many objects got created, the answer would be three. If I were to ask how many pizza objects are here at this point of the code, the answer is two. Because here's what's going to happen. P1 gets created. A pointer is going to point to a pizza. And oh yeah, that pizza object lives in memory location 100, so this guy has 100. And pizza points to that. Pizza P2 equals new pizza. Same thing, I'm going to create a pointer that's going to hold a pizza object. That new pizza object is put in memory location 200 and this guy points to that. If I say P2 equals new pizza, that's going to create a new pizza object, put it in location 300, let's say, set the pointer of P2 to point to 300, so it's going to point to this guy, it no longer points to 200, in which case this guy is dead. All right because no one is pointing to it. Yes? Repeat, please. There usually needs to be a method to do that. If you, if you truly want two objects that contain the same data, you would have to create a method that says duplicate object. All right? Now, the question would be, why would you want to do that? Okay, okay. so, you, so they, you create one and you say, I want three more just like it. Yeah, you could create a method that would say duplicate this object. That it would create an object, it would instantiate it and set all the properties to it, then it would return it. So you'd have a duplicate pizza method. I want to make sure you were really talking about really needing three objects and not needing three pointers to it, because it's important to differentiate between those two. Go ahead. Why would you need three objects? Because remember, each pizza class is meant to represent one pizza. Okay? So if you had three if you wanted to have an order that contained three pizzas, that would mean three pizza objects. Now, there may be a loop in there. You may have an order object, for example, or an order class that contains an array of pizzas. All right? And I may ask the order, what is the price? What is your price? And the order goes and loops through the three pizzas. All right? So yeah, you'd have a loop to loop through and total up those three pizzas, but if you really wanted there to be three pizzas on the order, you'd have three pizza objects. Right. 
again, think of these things as being things that are typically going to persist, right? Um, you know, a, a pizza, um, you know, the, the, the restaurant ships it out and then it's eaten and forgotten about. But let's say if I was a, uh, a craftsman that made, made wood things, all right, that, that shows you what kind of craftsman I would be because all I can say is make wood things. I can't even like say something to a craftsman, like a cabinet, let's say. So let's say I wanted to make, uh, I'm making a cabinet, and someone said I wanted two just like that. Um, or, or I get the idea, gee, I think, this, I think people are going to like this, I'm going to make two just like that. I would actually need, there would actually physically be in my warehouse three cabinets not one cabinet that I could sell three times, <laughs> right? So therefore, I would need three objects to represent those three cabinets. It doesn't matter. You still, when you were done, would have three of these things that you would sell separately. In other words, again, imagine a a plastic toy or something that the mold just stamps out. All right. When you're done with that, if you cranked out a thousand of them, you have a thousand little guys, little plastic toys, right? You wouldn't sell one of those toys a thousand times, right? You'd sell each of those individually. So there very likely could be an object to represent each one of them. All right. Again, that might be a little bit of a stretch, but that's the idea. Remember, an object represents one member of the entity. Now, again, you're right. In the case of a pizza, you know, an order consists of multiple pizzas. So, yes, we have an array of pizzas that we loop through, but there's still going to be individual objects in each of those pizzas. Yes? You did have your hand up? Yes. Okay. An array itself is a pointer to a array object. Depends how it's defined. All right, that's defined as. What about it? Yeah, that would be an array that would contain certain triangle, a certain number of triangles. All right. What do you mean by one location? Okay, let's let's say let's say I make an or let's say I make an order object for the pizzas. Okay. All right. And in fact, this might be a good thing to do. Well, I could say this. Um, I might have an order class that would have this. It's going to have an add to my order method that's going to accept a pizza. All right. Then it's going to have price that's going to tell me the price of the pizza. All right. So let's assume it's going to have that. Its attribute is going to be an array list of pizzas. Now, I'll talk about the difference between an array and an array list in a minute here. All right. Um, but if I had something like this, let's say someone called in, ordered two pizzas. All right. Um, I would do this. I'd create my order. I'd create my two pizzas. And remember, in a real application, there'd be a GUI behind this where you wouldn't manually be writing the code to say, this person wants a pepperoni, so P1 equals new pepperoni. You, know, you wouldn't be doing that. It would, th these classes would be hooked to a GUI that when you clicked add to order, it would go and do this. But at any rate, you would, you would create their order. You would say pizza, P1 equals new pizza. I'd set all the attributes of P1. I'd 
then I'd say P1 add to order. Then I do the same thing for P2. Then when I'm all done, I could say, give me the price of the order. And that would give it. Now, memory-wise, I actually wish, I'm going to answer this, and I'm going to go back and cover another example. And I wish I would have done them in the other order, but live and learn. I create the new order. So I create my order. It gets put in location 100, let's say. And there's an order class that contains an array list. That array list is itself an object that gets put somewhere on the heap. And this instance variable gets the pointer to the array object there inside the order, right. I then make my two pizzas and I add them. I add it to my order. It gets added to as an attribute in the array list. Now the other question would be is what if I just straight up created an array not in another class but like in my test code. I would say like um, like you did for the um, Mad Lib string Noun equals, then you had an array. All right. What that would do is that would create an array object pointer because this is an object and it would point to an array object on the heap. I would have the locations for the string. So this would be a pointer just like any other object reference would be a pointer. Questions? All right, here's what we're going to do. We'll cover constructors next time. What I want to do now is I want to create an order class. All right, I want to create an order class that contains um, pizzas. How many pizzas are someone going to order? It's not in the book. You don't, you don't need to look it up. Yeah, I know. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> yeah, as many as they want. We can't say. You know, you're having a party. You might get, you know, 20 pizzas. You know, you're just ordering yourself. You might get 18 pizzas, right? You don't know, right? So, therefore, the problem with arrays, all right, is that arrays, you, you, you got to size them a certain size. All right, if you notice, like in the book when we created an array, like for the Mad Libs, we created it with a certain number of uh, options. Or I think like when we did a deck of cards, we created a certain number of options, the 13 names or the four suits or whatever. That's okay for some things, some things where there is a static number, but really a lot of things there aren't going to, there isn't going to be a static number of things. There's going to be a variable number, all right? So there's a structure, there's a class in Java that's called an array list. That's like the new and improved array. All right, new and improved array. And what's new and improved about it is it can be any size you want it and you don't have to declare it in advance. All right, so hey, sounds like a good deal, right? We don't have to know how many pieces someone's going to have or do something dumb like well, we'll allow for a hundred pizzas and then we'll just make all the rest of them null or something goofy like that. We can make the order have as many pizzas as they have. And that's called an array list. Okay? So we're going to use an array list and not an array. All right? Our order class is going to have one attribute and two methods. Now, other attributes on the order too. The attribute we're going to have is we're going to have the array list of the pizzas that the person ordered. What would be some other good attributes on the order class? 
Yeah, the name of the person that placed the order. Let's say, let's say we're only talking about carry out, you know. We would have the name and phone of the person that placed the order. Maybe the time that they placed the order. All right? Something like that. All right? So those are all the attributes of an order. All right? And we won't put them in now, though. All right? Because we've done things like that before, so we don't need to worry about that right now. Maybe we'll close the loop. We'll go and do it next time or whatever. So the attribute that we're interested in, though, is it's going to have an array list of pizzas. All right? And it's going to have two methods, all right, to start. We could expand this again, but it's going to have add a pizza to a method and give me the cost of the order. All right? So let's go and let's create that class. You don't have to, but since I'm talking about, um, I would rather take this time to talk about array list as well. So if you want to use an array, you're welcome to. I like it. I, I can only think of three possible answers to that question. Well, I guess, I guess that's one option. The college told me to, but that's how it, work, how it works. I like the book. That would be one option. Number two is, I hate the book, but I hate my students. That would be a second option. <laughs> a third option is, is, I get some money by selling this book. That a, I wrote it under a pseudonym, or I own stock in the the thing. And let me tell you, none of those other things are true. I like the book. All right. I also, I also do my best to try to balance um, um, cost is actually a factor for me as well. I know, you know, things that are defined as textbooks cost a lot of money. Things that are just defined as I'm going to go to Barnes and Noble and find a book about Java are typically way less expensive. So I don't know like what that book was, 20 some bucks, 30 bucks? Yeah, something like that. If they did like the exact same thing but call that a textbook, it would probably be 100 bucks. I guess, yeah. Yeah. So with me, as far as the, like the book goes, if I see books that I think are good and are inexpensive, I'll favor those for books that I think are about as good, but like way more expensive. All right, so I'm going to create my order class. All right, I'm going to change that to say order. Ooh, we could all we could also figure out we could also figure out the uh, how long it's going to take to make this order, right? Remember we talked about the maximum of the baking times. Ooh, we got a third method on here. I'm I'm excited now. All right, so I want an array list. Now, one restriction or one limitation of array lists is that they have to contain objects. You cannot make an array list that contains primitives. Okay? There's a way around that, though. There's a way around everything. All right? So, that's, uh, uh, that's not a, a problem in this case. All right? But in future cases, um, you know, that, that, that could be a problem. All right? So, I'm going to create an array list. Because in this example, I want my array list to contain only pizzas. If I just make a plain array list and I don't say otherwise, I could put any object in there. I don't want any object in there. I just want p. 
pizzas. So, Java array list object. Let's see. I never quite remember this syntax. That's why I had to look it up. Okay, so array list. What is array list of? Pizza. And I'm going to call it pizzas equals new array list pizza. The one curveball that we have on this that we haven't seen before is in the angle brackets. I have the name of a class. I'm defining what the members of this array list are going to be. Because by default, I could mix any kind of things in array lists. All right? I could put a pizza object. I could put a bathroom fixture object. I could put a, any, a string. I could put anything in an array list. Therefore, I want, you know, this is a pizza shop. I know I'm putting pizzas in this order, right? That's the only thing people are allowed to order at my place. So therefore, I'm going to tell it that. Then, the compiler knows that I'm dealing with pizzas here. It doesn't have to worry about, like, gee, is, are they trying to sell a pizza or are they trying to sell a bathroom fixture? All right? So, I'm creating my array list, and I'm going to create two methods to start, and then we'll add one. This is going to be private. And I'm going to create a method that is public, void, and it will be add to order. What's the argument going to be? What am I going to pass into this? I'm going to pass in a pizza. Okay. Now, so far, I think in all our examples, we've been passing in as arguments and getting as return values um, primitives. We've been passing in integers or, well, I guess that's not completely true because we've done strings. But in this case, we can pass another object in. These are components. And the good news is, is if I pass in a pizza here, by the basis of object-oriented programming, anything that's associated with pizzas is now accessible inside the order object. So if I want to know the bake time for this, I can write a little loop that will go through and look to see what the bake time is. All right? If I want to know the price of it, I can ask each pizza individually, how much do you cost? And so on. So I'm going to say add to order, and I'm going to accept a pizza. And I'm going to call it arg pizza. Now what I want to do is I want to add this to the array list. Now, array lists have a whole bunch of methods associated with them. Again, this is not, not anything I wrote, right? This is part of the Java framework. And I can go in here and I can look to see all these things. One of the things it has is it has an add method. Why simply add something to the array? I only have to say what position to add it in, right? It's going to add it just in the position I do it. So if you think of an array, normally when you refer to an array, you refer to the subscript, sub 0, sub 1, sub 2. Here I can just add to the array list, and it just, the first one is 0, the second one is 1, the third one is two, and so on. It doesn't really matter, like with pizzas, what's considered the first pizza. The first one they order is the first pizza, right? So, I'm going to say pizzas, that's my array list, add arg pizza. So what that does is that takes the pizza that this order is given and adds it to the list of pizzas that belong to this order.
if the position mattered, um, if I was creating a list of the, if I was creating a list, of, if I was doing a golf tournament, I don't know how many people are in there, and I somehow wanted to have the array list of golfers to be in order by their scores, you know, the order in that case matters, right? So the first one should be the person with the lowest score, and so on down the line. So in this case, the order really doesn't matter, you know, the first say order, that's the first element in there. So this is that sort of thing, all right? Um, if you add, list your choices of majors, you know, or list your choices of, you know, what's your top preference, what's your second preference, what's your third preference. In that case, the ranking matters, so you would, you would do that. All right, so what this method is going to do is it's going to take whatever pizza we give it and put it on the list of pizzas. Now, how do we calculate the cost of the order? Well, cost of the order is simply, more than likely, the, the cost of each individual pizza. Now, we could add some difficulty to this, right, if we wanted to. Like, we could add delivery, and maybe there's an extra two bucks for delivery. Or maybe there's a delivery zone, free delivery within one mile, two dollars within two miles. So we could have an algorithm to determine that. But simplest case, the price of the pizza, or the price of the order, cost of the order, is the cost of each individual pizza. So describe what we're going to do here. We're going to loop through the array list for each pizza. We're going, we're going to look at each pizza in turn, and we're going to get its price and add it to the total. So I'm going to say double total equals zero. Or int i equals zero, right? All these things start with zero. How many elements are in an array list? I don't remember. But if I look, there is a size attribute that tells me how many attributes are in it. So, for, or a size method it tells me. So for i equals int, as long as i is less than pizzas dot size, each iteration increment i what do I want to do? Well, could do this a couple different ways. I'm going to do it this way. Pizza P equals pizzas get I. All right, what does that mean? Well, let's look at the method here. There is a get method that returns the element at the specific position in the index. So if I equals zero, if I say get zero, that gets the first element in the list. If I say get one, it gets the second element, and so on. Now, what element going to be in my case? It is a pizza, right? So what I want to do is I want to grab a pointer to that pizza because I want to do some calculation with it. I want to point to that pizza and say, pizza, tell me how much you cost. All right? Then I'm going to point to the next pizza. Pizza, tell, much, tell me how much you cost, and so on. So I have to point to it, because if I just say, pizza, tell me how much you cost, none of the pizzas know I'm talking to them, right? So they don't know to answer. So I have to point to the appropriate pizza. So that's what I'm doing here. My variable P is going to first point at the first pizza, 
then at the second pizza, then at the third pizza, for however many pizzas are on this order. I'm going to go a little longer today. Is that okay with everyone? If you do need to leave, feel, feel free to, and you can, you can watch the, the video. Yeah. There could be shorthand instructions that you could use to, to access it without creating a pizza object. All right. Now, notice one thing. Do you see the word new here? So does this method create any new objects? No. This method merely points to the objects that have already been created and already have been stored as part of this order. Now in our GUI, or whatever, someone could call in and say, and give me a small with mushrooms. And that piece of object is created. And then they say, no, nah, never mind, I don't want that. And you hit cancel or whatever in the GUI. Well, that piece of object could still be out there, but it never got added to the list, because you never called that add method. All right? So what am I going to do for that pizza? I'm going to say P, our total, equals total plus p dot what? I have to look at my pizza class and it is get cost. I do this for all of the pizzas and when I am done I return the total. All right. I'm going to try compiling this to make sure that it worked, that I don't have any syntax errors or anything like that. So I'm going to go to the command line. Because if that doesn't work, you know, I mean what's what's the point of of trying to do tests, you know, if you don't have the, the errors, the compile errors taken care of. So I'm going to go, whoops. All right, I'm in the right place. So I'm going to say Java C order And I get an error. All right. What's it telling me? It's telling me it doesn't know what an array list is. It doesn't know what an array list is. Why well, didn't make the array list? Don't blame me. That's supposed to be part of Java. Well, it is part of Java. However, we have to say where to find that. And we say that via an import statement. So what do we import? It is in job till, and it's called array list. So I have to put in my top line my code import java util array list. Yes. This tells the compiler, hey, when I talk about array lists, this is the one that I mean, not any other ones. I actually don't have to do this. I could say for each time I create an array list, I could say, um, you know, put the, put the whole um, java.util.array list. But this allows me just to type array list. Yes. My mate the compiler think harder. Yeah, this just this just uh, makes it a little easier on the compiler. So let me go and save this, and we'll try compiling again. And this time it works. Okay, so 
first test pass. Let's go and let, let's edit now the test, the unit test, to incorporate the logic of an order. So I'm going to leave this open. Minimize this. I don't want that one. I want this one. So. I'm going to say order O equals new order. All right. I'm going to create my two pizzas. So go order a large pepperoni and a medium without. All right, so I'm thinking that is correct. What am I doing? I'm creating my order. I'm creating the, as many pizzas as I need. In this case, I'm creating two of them. One medium, no pepperoni. One large with pepperoni. I add those to the orders, and something doesn't look right. I add both of those to the order by saying, add to order P. That adds it to my array list. I then say cal cost. The order knows that the cost of the order is simply the cost of all the pizzas. So it loops through each pizza and does a calculation. Now, let me make sure I save everything. All right, how much should this order cost? Well, medium with no pepperoni is eight. A large with pepperoni is 13, so it should cost $21. $21, yeah, we have a winner. All right, so what's important about this? Of all classes, uh, of all, all the topics covered in today's class, we went a little bit different direction, I thought, but that's okay. All right. Uh, what's important, number one, is remember about the way those objects create. All right. New is what creates an object. All right. So, for example, in my I create no pizzas in my order class because you do not anywhere see new pizza. So no pizzas are created in there. The new creates it. What makes a object disappear? When there's nothing pointing to it. If I assign value to something with an object reference, I simply am pointing to the object. I'm not creating a new object. 
Therefore, if I set two objects to point to the same object, I could use either reference to point to uh, and, and change it. It would be like referring to someone by their address or their phone number or their email address, right? They're one person, all right? So if the person at extension, I don't even remember my phone extension, whatever my phone extension is, 4796 maybe? Don't quote me on that. That would be like saying, uh, the person at extension 4796 got a haircut. Oh, amazingly, the person who has the email address of mzellers at lorraineccc.edu also got a haircut. Well, yeah, because both those things simply point to one person. All right, they're ways of pointing or addressing, in this case, an object or a person. So if I change an object, that object is changed for everyone that points to it, because they're all pointing to the same object. Other thing to talk about is that, again, the notion of an array list, why it's superior to regular arrays, because you can, um, it can be a dynamic size. The other issue relates to um, the fact that I can use objects to pass as arguments and to get as return values. All right? So I, I didn't do any with return values, but I did it as an argument. All right? And the good thing is, is when you use it like this, any object that uses that object has the full run of any of the attributes of it. All right? Um, let me rephrase that. Any of the methods of it that are made public. It shouldn't have full run of the attributes because you should make those private. All right. What to do next time, a little bit more about pointers because that's a little bit of a tricky concept. We're going to talk about constructors, and we're going to talk about then adding a bake time method to this. Calculate the bake time. That would be a good exercise for you to try between now and then if you're bored. Try adding a method, try expanding my unit test to calculate what the bake time is for an order. And again, we define that as being the maximum of all the bake times. All right, we'll see you in lab.